Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. Uh, I'm Melissa, and on behalf of the UNSW Data Science Hub and UNSW School of Mathematics and Statistics, welcome to Can AI Save Humanity? Um, just to start with, with a bit of housekeeping, uh, the accessible bathroom is just out those doors and behind, and the bathrooms are out the doors and to the left. Um, today we've assembled some of the finest minds who are working on solving some of the world's biggest problems using AI. Today's discussion will be led by Ruben Learman, who's also known as the surfing scientist. So Ruben is a surfer who has a physics degree and a passion for all things scientific. You may have seen him on a few ABC programs such as Catalyst, uh, Studio 3, or as the scientist on PlaySchool. Uh, he still visits hundreds of primary and high schools every year and has published hundreds of resources for teachers and students. Um, we've only got an hour today and I think this is going to be a really intriguing discussion. So um, without further ado, I'll hand you over now to Ruben. Thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Thank you and, and yes, welcome to all of you uh, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, the Bidjigal and Gadigal people on the lands of who we are meeting this evening. They're the traditional custodians of this land and I'll also pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us here this evening. Um, I'll introduce the panel first and it's wonderful to be back at Uni of New South Wales. I, some t I give an occasional guest lecture here, so m my background's in physics, I don't use AI and I'm as excited as you are to hear more about it. Uh, I don't use AI in my research, I, I read as much about it as you do. I give the occasional lecture here at Uni of New South Wales about how the human body gains and loses weight, um, so if you're keen to come and learn some human biochemistry, 18th of September, I'll be back here with the third years, same to the panel. Um, but let me introduce our panel because they're really the stars of the show here tonight and um, we, they do fascinating things. So starting over on your left, uh, Dr. Daniel Folster is an ecologist who uses uh, computer models and large data sets to test fundamental ideas about uh, processes that shape biological communities, such as Australian plants, and we're going to hear exactly what he does uh, throughout the course of the evening. Uh, Dr. Shaffer Waters is a stem cell biologist who does amazing things with machine learning, uses it as a tool to, uh, for instance, work in cystic fibrosis and um, primary cilia dyskinesia, which we will talk about throughout the course of the evening. Things that you might not have thought about when you heard that tonight is about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, on my left, your right, is um, Professor Yanan Fan, who is a statistician who uses uh, machine learning for a, an incredible range of things, including in um, the law, which again, you may not have realized that we can use it in how um, judges um, make their judgments or checking how they make their judgments. Uh, and finally, Professor Shane Keating, who's an applied mathematician, who uh, is very keen for us to think about the positive side of AI, who uses it in a multitude of ways. And I actually want to start with you um, with a very simple question, because I think judging by the audience and judging by myself and my knowledge as well, I'm a physicist and you, I, I don't use code enough to really understand how AI works. Can we start with some definitions? What is artificial intelligence? What's the difference between AI and machine learning? What's deep learning? So that everyone in the room is kind of on the same page to begin with. Sure, well thanks for that, Ruben. Yeah, so I think about artificial intelligence and machine learning and neural networks maybe a bit differently from many people. Those are all slightly different things, so I think it's important to be able to distinguish mm. them. So what is artificial intelligence? To me, artificial intelligence is about getting machines or software to do things that we normally think require human intelligence. Things like driving a car or understanding speech or recognizing faces or making a decision like, should I bring an umbrella with work with me today? So that's artificial intelligence. How is that different from machine learning? Well, machine learning is a way to create artificial intelligence. It does exactly the same way that learning creates human intelligence. Machine learning helps create artificial intelligence. Another term you might have heard as well is as a neural network. A neural network 
is a way of not mimicking intelligence, but mimicking the way the brain is built by creating these artificial neurons or nodes and passing information through this network of neurons or nodes in order to be able to extract some information. One more term you might have heard is deep learning. You mentioned that. Deep learning is a kind of machine learning that uses neural networks. It, in fact, it uses stacks of neural networks in order to be able to make decisions based on complex information coming out, based on some data that we may use to train uh, the, the system, and then making, it, making some sort of output or decision from that. Um, I think the other uh, elephant in the room that we should probably address early on so we can get onto the good stuff is that there's been, obviously this year, uh, chat GPT has exploded into the media and I think for a lot of people they're thinking about machine learning and artificial intelligence for the first time they may not have heard it before this year so what's happened in the last year why why did chat GPT uh, just suddenly blow up in the world and we're all hearing about it and uh, is it intelligent um, I've heard that it can't solve or it gives a very dumb solution to for instance the the age-old riddle of I've got a five liter jug I've got a three liter uh, a two liter jug how do I measure out three liters? And uh, I don't know if this is actually true, but I've heard it gives you a really crazy answer to something really simple and yet sure. really amazing answers to things that you think, how can a computer know to write like that? So what sure. is ChatGPT? Well, so first of all, artificial intelligence is, is in the consciousness now of, of sort of society, but of course it's been around for a long time. Pe computer long? scientists what, what have, been, have been working on this since the 50s and with limited success. And partly that's because, why, why has it become such a thing recently? Well, because, because first of all, we've got much more powerful computers that can sort of churn through all of these algorithms. But, but most important of all is that we have lots of data in a, in a format that is easy for machines to digest. And coming to ChatGPT and what we call large language models, what are they doing? They are churning through enormous data sets of written text, spoken text, video that is scraped from the internet and they are looking for correlations, statistical relationships between sentences, between parts of sentences. So when you type in, you know, in, in your Word document, you know, or in, your, in your, your email, right, you type in, you know, dear Shane, I want to ask you a question about, and it says, you know, swipe to, to complete the sentence. That is, that is using statistical correlations between the first part of a sentence that someone writes and what typically someone writes at the end. The same thing with Google searches, right? So large language models are like that on steroids. They can basically just do that again and again and again and create sentences that to us appear like they were written by a human intelligence. But there is no intelligence behind that. There is no general uh, deductive reasoning intelligence behind that. It is purely statistical correlation. So there really should be called more like statistical models rather than artificial intelligence, perhaps. Right, right. And so a question for our statistician, um, because we're, we're being told a lot about the dangers of these things that you know it could uh, influence the outcome of elections and so forth. And when the average person thinks, hey, this was built by humans, and we might call them computer engineers, we like to think that engineers know how the inventions they make work, and yet with Chat GPT and other uh, AI systems, um, it, sometimes they don't know how it works. But what does it mean that they don't know how it works? And, and what's dangerous about these things, potentially? Yeah, so Chat GPT, I think it's particularly dangerous in that it sounds like a human. But uh, what's dangerous is that the, these machine learning models or AI that's popular these days um, makes everybody think that they are experts at at using these models, but at the, so so that means they you know even if they don't they don't understand they may not understand I should say they may not understand that they need to understand how the models are trained so those machine learning models how did it learn did it learn from the correct set of data um, what if they learned from you know a, a biased set of data that's only of you know you I'm sure people have heard of biased um, outcomes because it was trained on a biased set of data. So you need to kind of understand the training process. You need to understand the models because even as powerful as those models are, every model can fail, right? So you need to understand um, what the output really mean. So I think, you know, 
everybody who's using it should have a, a good understanding of, at least a basic understanding, a bit like ethics training, a basic understanding of what these models are actually doing before you go on and do all the good that you're going to do with AI. So yeah. I think that's a good way, a segue for us to start talking about, well, what, what, what do people do with it? Because it's just this big mystery, like, and I'm, I'm assuming that people in the audience are still sort of thinking, what, what do all of that actually mean? So let's talk about some actual um, specific applications so that it starts to become clear, what, what is this stuff, this AI? What, what's happening when you do machine learning? And by the way, if you have questions that you would like to ask, we will have time for some questions, and we're gonna um, take them via a um, Slido question. So sli.do, if you type that into your smartphone's um, web browser and use there's a hashtag that you can use, and we'll, if you post your questions, and same for the people who are tuned in online, the hashtag is AIXHumanity, or one word. So if you go to Slido and um, type in hashtag AIXHumanity, um, your questions, put them in, they'll get upvoted, and towards the end of the evening, we will take some of your questions. But it'd be great to start looking at how do we actually use this uh, AI? and um, I'll start on the, your left. Um, Daniel, the terms biology and machine learning sort of feel like they don't belong in the same sentence because biology versus machines, we don't think of machines as being biological, but you use, you're a biologist and an ecologist, so what do you actually use machine learning for or what is it used for in your field? Yeah, thanks Ruben. So I might talk about what it's used for in the, the field more generally and it's really exciting. It's massively transforming our ability to measure things about the natural world. So biologists, you know, we like to go out in the field, measure things, we take a ruler, some calipers, maybe some scales or a bucket. Then we get all these extra tools like cameras and sound recorders and other things and drones and satellites. But all of those digital tools, they increase our ability to measure things, but not really, it's like part one. We get like an image with a bunch of pixels. We get a sound with a bunch of frequencies in it. We don't really, that's not the sort of things that biologists want to know, like what organism is this? Which individual is this, you know? And then AI is part two of that digital helper kit, you know, that's helping us measure the natural world because um, AI algorithms, we can train them to recognize particular features of organisms. So let's say you've got a bunch of images and you want to be able to pick out you know, does this image have a turtle in it or something like that? You can treat, t train an algorithm to recognize that and then feed it thousands and thousands of images. So whereas we, we got the cameras and the sound recorders, all that really happened is we ended up with a pile of images and sounds that we hadn't processed. AI is now coming in as that assistant that we need to help us turn that into data, which is what's in those things, and that's massive in biology. So it's like having a couple of million PhD students you can just offload your work onto, but now they'll do it without <laughs> complaining. Is that it? <laughs> no comment. <yet. laughs> um, but, but seriously, I think for what the average person can really understand clearly is that if you've got, for instance, so let's talk about some specific examples in, um, well, you, you, you're an ecologist and particularly plants, yeah? So what sort of things, what sort of data um, do people measure that it would just take too long to sit and go through that a computer can go through really quickly. It might be, so. Yeah, I'll pick out a couple of examples. Mm. Uh, so one is that, you know, on my phone, I have an app called iNaturalist, and uh, I can take a picture of a, of, a, of a plant or an organism. And there's actually an AI algorithm behind there that can make guesses at what that thing is, and it's being trained on all the accumulated knowledge of uh, what people have ID'd as correct or not. And as the scientists in the community, we can record where species are occurring at, at a scale which was never possible before. It's like sending out teams of government scientists out and, and, and we used to do that a long time ago. We don't do it as much now. And just taking surveys, we've got people out using this thing all the time. Um, I've got a colleague who studies bird breeding colonies and uh, she wants to know how many birds are in this colony. Um, the hard way is to wade around in the water and you get glimpses of birds and you scare them off and things like that, and ecologists still do that, but it's, it's very hard to do. The new way is you fly a drone over the colony and then you process the imagery and you count the numbers of birds in the colony. And so you can make measurements that were never really possible before. 
Very exciting, isn't it? I, I keep saying to, I work a lot with school kids and I'm, I'm saying to uh, kids as young as primary school and high school that this is the most exciting time to get into science because of the fact that you can suddenly measure things that would have just taken too long. Mm. Um, Shafa, your work is uh, amazing. You work with stem cells, but organoids. Can you first of all explain so that we can follow what you're actually doing? What is an organoid? Sure. Um, so an organoid is a miniaturized organ, but also a very rudimentary organ. So if you could imagine your lungs or your gut, um, if you can imagine that lung having been created inside the lab in a miniaturized scale, and it's sitting on a Petri dish. And what that means is that um, we now have a replica of your organ of interest, and that could be any part of your body. And the reason it's important is because um, when it comes to medication, where we are going in um, medicine is that we would like to be able to offer everyone personalized medicine. So not medicine that we give to the masses, but medicine that is directed to you and it's best for your um, type of disease. Um, and this is quite important for rare diseases, which it's harder to treat because there hasn't been as much studies done. So when we have a child who visits the hospital or an adult, we can collect a small biopsy of the organ of interest. And I keep going back to the lung because that's primarily the type of disorders that I've worked with, rare lung diseases. So we might take a brushing of the nose, which is a representative of your airway. And in the lab, we use certain techniques to be able to recreate this rudimentary miniaturized organoid, miniaturized lung. And then we can test a number of drugs on these organoids. And these organoids, the best way I can describe them is if you were to think about as if there were a hundred, a million little balls under a microscope that we are looking at. And what happens to these balls of cells when a drug is added to them that causes a response, a, um, a favorable response, these organoids, they start swelling and they become bigger. With the naked eye, even if you are looking under a microscope, I cannot sit there and measure the million little balls under the microscope and say that you are swelling at this rate and at, um, in comparison to the other organoid at a different rate. So this is where machine learning and this is where artificial intelligence algorithms comes in. Similarly to what was said, we are using measurements and a lot of measurements to be able to actually ascertain what is the response of a drug for a certain individual. And there is training involved. If you don't train the algorithms on good images, on decent images, then you're gonna end up with uh, biased results. So, I mean, I only just learnt about your work preparing for tonight and had no idea that this is going on, that you can take a biopsy from a kid who's got cystic fibrosis, take those cells uh, and regrow them. They're stem cells that you're working with, so you can regrow different kinds of cells and you're recreating a tiny part of, in a Petri dish, you're growing tiny little miniature organs Millions of them, did you just say? Millions, depending on how many different drugs we've got to test. But right, yes. so, and then now you can do experiments on those without having to harm the child. Okay. This is now in a Petri dish. And the results of your research will tell out of the, you've got more than one drug that you could treat this kid with, and they're gonna respond better to some than the other, and the output of your research is, is what? What's the final result? You, when you're finished, you give what to who? To a doctor or? To, um, to a specialist, so mm. it, it depends on what the question has been raised and what it is that um, the investigatory team has asked us to deliver, but most of the time it is, we've got five different medication and we are not sure out of these five medications which might be the best targeted drug for this 
individual, the medications are quite expensive. We are talking about $500,000 per year for the rest of your life. And sometimes when you start on a medication, you cannot easily swap and go to another medication. And there is a possibility of having side effects. So you want to avoid all of those. And that's why it becomes quite important to be able to have this surrogate system where you've got your own stem cells created, your own avatar. And we do call them mini avatars in the lab for us to be able to do all of these testing. And uh, there are occasions where the drugs which are on the market are actually no use to that individual, but then there are experimental drugs that we have access to, and that is the hope for the future, that even if we may not be able to help an individual today, right now, but in future there will be another drug for them. So that really is just amazing that we're, we're essentially living in the future so because not only then does that kid who may not have responded well to that drug so you, you just don't give it to them, that means they also don't get any negative side effects that they might have got if you did put them on that drug and they would have only got the negative side effects. Absolutely. The liver damage is usually something that we worry about quite a bit and if um, that's something that we can avoid. Um, that is definitely a favorable outcome with, with most individuals, especially when we're talking about quite young kids. Yeah, so hopefully that, I mean, you know, that's the, the part of AI that I've been so keen for people to hear more about rather than the negative stuff we've been hearing in the media because that, that is just life-saving stuff for children who are very young, who have got a whole life ahead of them and suddenly we're opening up a, a much brighter future and it's only going to get better which is why I keep saying now's the time to get into science. Um, so there's two applications that I hopefully you're all um, delighted to know that these things are actually happening and you can see that it's more than just um, what this chat GPT is all about. Now over here we've got like a, a multitudes of um, applications. Yannan, I was asking you before, um, are you surprised at just how many different applications there are of AI and what, what's some of your favourites that you've been working on? I'm not surprised, no. <laughs> um, so, I, yeah, maybe one of the surprising ones that I'm working on is, the, is, is with um, law and law judgments. So we tend to think of data and AI as, we think of data as numerical things, but in fact it's, it can be text, it can be words and it can be images, it can be videos, it can be anything you, you, you like, it's just a matter of converting them and work with. So AI now is able to work with at, at scale and, and, and all sorts of different types of data. And with the um, law application, so, we're, so with, with, with this project we're doing uh, with, with the Faculty of Law, um, so we're looking at um, judgments where, you know, um, we're, we're, all, we're all humans and we tend to think of judges as um, um, unbiased. But even judges are prone to unconscious bias. So the project, it basically it goes to take all these documents from the, the judgments that, that, the, uh, that the, the judges have written and in, and in trying to understand if there's any um, kind of unconscious bias or, or, um, or even in, it, uh, something unfair about the way that the judgment that hasn't been seen, that, that, that's not known but has been suspected in past. So that's been really fun. So, so for example, um, it, we, these judgments from just the family court can be you know, thousands and thousands of judgments. Each one of them are hundreds of pages of really difficult to read legal language. And what we're trying to do is just to try to look at it more, from a more systematic way of um, sort of going to what Shane was saying, getting that correlation between, so distilling the languages in a way that, you know, looking at what, what patterns there are in, in what the um, judges are saying. And perhaps are the judges, you know, spending too much time talking about a, when, when they're judging how good a father is in terms of his ability to um, bring money or, or employment type of things, whereas when it comes to mother, do they disproportionately think about you know, their ability as a, as a caregiver, it, it, sort of differences um, between how the judges might subconsciously. Right, yeah. right. So, and so it might help for some, I, I, I know that um, 
one of my sisters was quite surprised to discover that you can just read a lot of judgments online because everything's been digitized and it's all just sitting there waiting for someone to come along and, and do this work. So I think maybe another thing that might surprise a lot of people who haven't thought about this uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning before is just how much we have digitized everything that's happened. So every judgment that happens in every court, just about, as far as I know in Australia, I think every single judgment that's happened in the last 20 years or more, you could, it's all just sitting there waiting for you to do whatever you like with. But you can't read it all because the, the average reading speed is, what, 150 words per minute for a, a reasonable adult. So machine learning can trawl through all of those um, judgments. What does it look like? What do you get out at the other end? You, so you've run your um, machine learning algorithm. What do you get out? What are you looking at? You're looking at evidence, right? In my case, um, it's not necessarily the same in the cases that, that um, Sh Sh Shafar and um, Daniel talked about before. But, but in my case, because I'm a statistician, I'm looking at evidence of, of differences um, of a hypothesis test. I, I've got a suspicion that there's something might be wrong, and I'm, going, I'm using that as, as my data source to support my, my hypothesis. So you really need a human in the loop here, right? Like Absolutely. It, 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 it can't just... Uh, it, it's not like computers are going to suddenly take over everything because we still need the Absolutely. human intelligence to look at, um, yeah. to first of all design the algorithm, yeah. I, I guess, and that's where uh, yeah. you're designing the algorithms and then running the algorithms. That's right, yeah. What's the response been like from, have you spoken to judges, have you spoken to lawyers, how are they feeling about this? Are they scared that they're going to lose their jobs? Uh, um, I think lawyers. So, some, some sort of, I don't know, I'm not in a position you to say that, to I comment. actually don't know. <laughs> yeah, no. We want to keep them on yeah, side, yeah, yeah. so I'll say but, all but the bad yeah, things. But yeah, I, I would probably add that the, uh, a profession like the law profession where they rely, uh, are increasingly reliant on um, artificial intelligence tools, right? They absolutely need to have those search engines, they absolutely need to have those um, referencing um, and, and assistance in reading as well. So they absolutely need a lot of AI. There's an overwhelming yeah. amount of um, uh, research for a young lawyer to have to do just to get up to speed to on the, the case. And, yeah, yeah, right. Um, and Shane, you, you, you as well, you have so many different applications that you're looking at. I wonder when you were first, you're a mathematician, when you were studying mathematics as an undergraduate, did, did you foresee just how many different applications there were for what you're doing and what are you doing? Yeah, well, maybe I'll start there. What do I yeah. do? Uh, so so um, I'm an applied mathematician, yeah. um, but I'm particularly interested in developing ways of using mathematics to better understand our planet. The climate, the oceans, the ice, the land. And there are, there are lots and lots of powerful ways in which mathematics can, can do that. And, and primarily, it comes back to this, this problem of data, just the sheer amounts of data that we have available to us. What sort of data have you got? Yeah, so, so the data that I mostly work with is actually data um, from space, right? So, so measuring um, sea level, m measuring sea ice, measuring um, ocean currents, and, and of course, imagery uh, of our planet from space. So how do we take that data, and how do we e extract knowledge from that data? How do we turn data into actionable knowledge? That's, that's for me what, what mathematics and statistics is for Earth science. And so, I, again, for a lot of people uh, who haven't thought about this, they might not realise just how much data is streaming down to the Earth from all the satellites we've got up there measuring all sorts of things. You mentioned sea level. Um, what other things can we measure from space with a satellite that's not touching the Earth, it's not what, what, but yet it can measure all this amazing stuff? What other kinds of... Yeah, totally. I mean, I, so we use, we use space data all the time, like in our everyday lives, right? So your phone has has a, a GPS on it, right? So GPS, is, it's the series of satellites um, in, in, high, uh, in me medium Earth at, um, orbit, and, and basically your, your phone is receiving a signal from those satellites all the time, and if it has enough of them in the sky, you can basically triangulate your position. That's how GPS works. But GPS also sort of bounces off this Earth's surface, right? It's a, it's a signal that's sent from a satellite, it bounces off the Earth's surface, and it changes when it bounces off the Earth's surface, and it carries with it some information about the surface that it's bounced off, be that foliage, be that uh, wetlands, be that the, the ocean surface, or be that ice. So we have a project 
um, with, with a company called Spire, uh, who, who is a commercial satellite company, um, that is using these reflected GPS signals, these bounced GPS signals, to understand what is happening with sea ice. Now, I don't know if, if you guys have been following the news recently, but the, the news is not good <laughs> about sea ice, right? The Antarctic sea ice cover is incredibly low. It's the lowest that it's been in the last 40 years. That's as long as we've been measuring sea ice from space. So there are dramatic changes occurring both in the Arctic and the Antarctic in the sea ice cover, and we need to be able to monitor that and understand that and to understand the details about how sea ice is changing in order to be able to make better predictions about what will happen in the future. Sea ice is sometimes called the canary in the coal mine for the climate system, right? So it's an early warning system for climate change. So how do we do that? Well, one of the problems, of course, is that sea ice is at the poles. It's really expensive and difficult and dangerous to get there and, and make measurements. Even satellites have a hard time measuring sea ice because they tend to be kind of cloudy places. And if you're just looking at you know, visual imagery of sea ice, uh, it's often covered in cloud. Well, GPS offers us a way around that because it can, it, can, it can pass through cloud and can make these measurements. And so we've been working with this company, Spire, to, to combine um, this new GPS reflected uh, measurements of sea ice with an artificial intelligence model for how how that signal has changed by being bounced off different kinds of sea ice. You know, sea ice changes in its, its uh, <coughs> dielectric constant or its roughness based on how old it is. And we can, we can extract that information, but there's just so much of it um, that we have to be able to, to, be able to filter it. And, and that's maybe where machine learning and artificial intelligence plays a really essential role for understanding our, our, our planet from space. It's just filtering down that, da down that data. For, let me give you another example. NASA, just NASA's constellation of spacecraft. That, um, of course, includes things like you know, Mars probes and the Voyager probes, but also many, many satellites making measurements of the Earth. NASA collects terabytes of data every single day. And there is no way a human being, or many human beings, would ever be able to analyze all of that data. Most of it, in fact, the vast majority of it, goes unused. So how do we put that, work, that data to work? By using things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. And you can just find, uh, I'm just constantly surprised by all the uh, applications that I keep hearing about. There's another one that I heard about this evening that I have to, well, I'll ask Shafa to share that um, there's some data you can get from kids just by asking them to cough and recording mm -hmm. the sound of their cough. What can we learn from the sound of a cough? A, a lot, and I don't think that's new. Well, do you remember ever going to a GP and what's the first thing they ask you to do if you say, I've got an upper respiratory infection? They say, cough for me. Mm. And you cough, and then they have some way of their brain, their intelligent brain, having been trained what it means to have a wet cough or a dry cough, and then they are listening to your lungs and they're making a decision based on their trainings as to what that cough is. What happened during COVID, we didn't have access to our GPs. We had to think differently and we had to consider how do I still get my GP hearing me cough? So what did we do? We used our phones to be able to record coughs and sent it through and started building models that were trained on coughs, which doctors decided what that cough means and then there were other pathology and other data that came with it and a model was put together as cough that sounds like this usually correlate with this disease. And this is what we train our GPs as they go through their training. But what we do now is we are using an algorithm which is with a very high degree of confidence is suggesting what that cough actually sounds like and what that means. Now, does that mean that our doctor is out of job? They're not. This is a tool. This is just another tool that we've introduced to make decision making easier. It's extraordinary. I mean, I guess it makes sense <laughs> if you've studied medicine that, that you, you learn how to listen to different coughs and you can separate different um, diseases from the sound of the cough. So it's really the doctors taught the computers how to, okay, that cough is 
cystic fibrosis, that cough is asthma, or mate, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but that, that and, and then you show the computer enough that are cystic fibrosis and enough that are asthma, and if you do that with thousands of times, it will spot some pattern and then generate some coefficient within some equation so that the next yeah. time it hears it, it's probably that. Yeah, and so, the pattern can become even more strong in a way that um, the cough could be correlated with a certain lobe of the lungs, which is just so much more sophisticated. But all of those require a lot of training time, right. and training time is what's important when it comes to fidelity of an algorithm which is put together. So we still need humans to be the experts first and teach the computers. And Daniel, you've got some really great thoughts on this, and you've, you've um, expressed them uh, really beautifully. So, um, what's what's the excitement for you about the future of biology? Like, can you see questions that we would just wouldn't have been able to answer? Like, for instance, evolution just takes so long for it to happen that we can't sit around and measure it. So, what can we do with these computer models, and um, how can computers uh, help biologists do experiments that they might not otherwise have been able to do them? Mm, gosh, that's a tricky question. Um, well, I, so I, we, we, we talked there about training and mm. we've talked about the need to, to train models. What I think AI is really good at doing is where we have repetitive things mm. and where we've got repetitive things that we need to do over and over and over again. And we've got the data that we can train the models and you've talked about needing the humans, we need the humans to you know, help identify the outcomes that we train against, for example. That's, that's at least in bio biological spheres how we're working. So I think it's going to be really important for increasing the amount of stuff we can do in that sort of, um, increasing the volume of things we can do. And I'm less convinced that it's sort of going to solve fundamentally new problems. So, you know, there's, I don't think at this stage, and you know, people in the audience and, uh, and experts might feel differently, but I don't sort of see truly intelligent software at this stage, which is solving scientific problems in ways that you know, we couldn't have imagined. It's more, it's, it's drawing out linkages in, in data that we may not have seen before, but it's, it's mostly helping with these repetitive tasks in, in my field. And so scientists are gonna have these extra assistants that they can deploy. Um, to help them solve problems. And so there's two in, in biology that I think are really important. There's the measuring things, one that I, that I talked about before. And there's also uh, writing computer code. Um, so you talked about chat GPT. Turns out one of the things that can do quite well is write bits of computer code where it's seen lots of examples that do particular things um, that it's seen before on, on the internet or wherever it was trained. And biologists, you know, we're not natural computer coders. We need more biologists. We need more computer coding in biology. There's uh, computer coders earn very high salaries, justifiably. We're low unemployment. You know, that we're just not going to get more computer coders in biology very quickly and easily. But we can have help from AI, uh, basically writing the code that we need to write and to analyze and to generate insights. And free us up to think about the systems and how they work, which is the things I think humans still do really well, and get help from the machines for the things that take up a lot of our time, but that they can actually do better. Yes, yeah, so I see one of your passions is trying to get uh, biologists to learn how to code a little bit. But it is. But if, if we can um, ask a large language model to just do the coding for us, then we don't have to get real good at that. At some point, though, we still ask need it to help you. I yeah, think. right. Yeah. We still yeah. need to come up with a question, right? So absolutely, we yeah. need the fundamentals. Yeah. So you need, you still need to know your biology before you can use your uh, machine learning to do better biology, Correct. so to speak. Yeah. Um, so the the um, hopefully again the vibe in the room is that it just has these applications beyond what you might think of when you first hear the the term machine learning. Um, Shane, you've thought about this a lot. Um, you're, you're a mathematician, you've been using it a lot. Are there applications that have surprised you or are there ones that particularly delight you? Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, I talk with a lot of different people who are using um, uh, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and all sorts of surprising areas of um, 
of science, and, and you know, one of the ones that really inspires me actually comes from, from astronomy, not my, not my area at all, but you know, talking with people who are using artificial intelligence to be able to identify and characterize galaxies, right? So using these amazing images that we're getting back from the James Webb Telescope and others um, to, to be able to probe our, our universe in, in, and, and learn about our universe in ways that we just didn't have the ability to before. I find that just so inspiring. You know, it, you know there would have been a time when your entire PhD would be devoted to just one type of one kind of star in, you know, like, and that was what you did. But now we can do so much more. And, and it allows us to sort of accelerate our, get to the, get to the curious bit faster. There's an analogy that I often think about when I think about artificial intelligence. We've been describing AI as a tool, right? Something that can help scientists work faster. And it reminds me a little of, of this story of, of, you know, back in the, the, the sort of 17 and 1800s, astronomers were, it was an incredibly time-consuming job to be an astronomer. You had to do calculations by hand, right? <laughs> And, and multiplying together these numbers, and it would take you forever. And if you make a mistake, it's a disaster, right? Then along come logarithms. And I'm hoping that there's some students who are going to be watching this and thinking, like, what on earth are logarithms for? Logarithms were invented as a way of making multiplication easier. They allow you to turn multiplying, which is hard, into addition, which is easy. And it's been described as multiplying the life of astronomers by two. In other words, you could get twice as much done in your lifetime because you didn't have to be dealing with these big, long, complicated multiplications. You could just do, you could use logarithms. I mean, I think that that's kind of the way that we're gonna be thinking about artificial intelligence. It just speeds us up and gets us to generate hypotheses faster, design experiments to test those hypotheses more quickly, and be able to get to the fun bit faster. And it, 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 that, <laughs> you're right, that is the fun bit rather than having to do logarithm, well, having to <laughs> do the number crunching. Um, Yannan, you, uh, another really great example that you've worked on is tumour detection, which is, uh, um, in, and I guess that's, again, images to, you, you need to start with. How does it work to, how do you train a computer to um, detect tumours? And can they eventually do it better than humans? I think, I, I, so yeah, so, the, so for tumor detection, I think this is um, something that's fairly exciting in the last five to 10 years with, with deep learning models where previously, if you go to the doctor and you take an image and, and then the doctor would take that image and have a look and sort of do a big circle on maybe it's tumor, maybe it's not tumor. Um, now they have this artificial intelligence to, to help them, um, uh, I mean, they have to train them, um, but they have, uh, what I heard was they now have the, the, the accuracy of 99.9% .9 in terms of getting that right, and there's also a precision as well, so when the doctor does this, it means cut all that out just in case, right, whereas the artificial intelligence might be able to tell you, well, you only need to cut out this much, so that's really, again, going to that helping medicine, it's enormous, enormously useful. And it will be much um, more accurate, I have to say, than, than um, a doctor, because a doctor could be trained, it depends on his experience, um, and there's a lot of biases, we <laughs> preconceived biases. I was told a story once when the radiographer looks at um, tumors, after 200, they just cannot tell what's going on anymore because our mind is, is not clear anymore. So there's an example of where the artificial intelligence is going to do better than, than us. It doesn't get tired. It doesn't, it doesn't get tired. It doesn't have kids yeah. that need to be picked up from school. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's hopefully, um, for those who were thinking Jeepers, um, it, it's all doom and gloom, um, it just isn't doom and gloom, it's, it's all excitement. I think I might um, look at some of the questions that we've got coming through from Slido and uh, read just a few uh, out to you so we can sort of engage the audience a little bit here. And I've got one that, um, well, I don't know who wants to answer this one, but at what point can AI create its own algorithms? Is it already able to do that now? If, if you said to AI, and that was from an anonymous person, but it, it's, um, it's a good one. Um, 
Are we at the point where you could say to uh, a large language model, uh, you know, create an algorithm and is there, a, is there any risk that it will then go on and keep creating algorithms and, and outsmart us? Does anyone want to have a go at that? I mean, I know that that's taking us back down the dark road, but what do you think, Daniel? I'll just start with the, uh, how complex an algorithm, because an algorithm could be something relatively straightforward and definitely it can do that. So, you know, you can say, chat GPT, write me a function that does this, or write me a, and it, if it's seen something, you know, vaguely equivalent, it will be able to statistically um, represent, you know, the sorts of things it's seen on there, it's been trained on and very often they just compile and work. As to how complex they can go, I'll, I'll throw to someone else and see what they think. I've actually got an example myself, I did it. Um, so uh, there is some software called Blender, which you can, it's 3D, 3D uh, animation software, so you can draw anything. Um, you start with cylinders, spheres, cubes, and then you can distort them and then you can animate them. So. Um, I just read somewhere that you can ask ChatGPT to write you some Blender code. So I wrote, I asked ChatGPT to write me some uh, Python code that you can load into Blender um, to draw me a water molecule and make the oxygen atom red and the hydrogen atoms white. And it wrote the code and I poked it into the bit where you need to poke it into um, Blender and hit go and boom, there's, there's your a water algorithm. molecule. That blew my mind. I mean, and then I thought, well, okay, it's pretty good, but I like, that is excellent, but I can't see that that is yet anything scary. Um, is any, are, are any of you, do you have any slight nerves about the future? Do you think that it's warranted that there is a little bit of a risk here or do you think it's overblown? Can I get all your thoughts on that? What do you, what do you think, Yannan? Is it uh, I think I have a slight worry that we might, um, that, that we're so, we're gonna be so used to having these artificial intelligence or, or, or these um, tools out there that we'll forget uh, how to do things properly. But maybe it doesn't matter. I'm not, I haven't decided on whether it matters or not. So but I guess um, that comes back to, the, to, to get um, machine learning to do anything useful for you, you've gotta ask it a really good question. And to ask it a really good question, you've gotta know your field really well. So. Um, so hopefully th we don't take the humans out of the loop there. Um, what about you, Shane? What do you think? Are you, are you positive yeah, about the I mean, future? I think, I think um, one of the challenges is going to be how do we interpret what, what artificial intelligence gives us, right? How, what, where does the human judgment come in? Mm. Do we just take it at face value? Um, and I think, I think part of that is going, you know, there's going to be possibly an erosion of trust a little bit. Um, potentially quite a lot because of what artificial intelligence can do. So we're already seeing this with deep fakes, with, with sort of disinformation, misinformation. I think that's, that's going to be a real challenge, A, in that that's existing and it's going to be in our, in our sort of ecosystem, but B, because it means that people will trust data less, right? They will trust things that are written by scientists less because Maybe there'll be a whole bunch of science papers written by AI, right? And, and I think that's, that's gonna be a problem, but that's a human problem rather than a AI problem. That's how do humans respond to this new tool? Yeah, trust seems to be coming up a lot, obviously. And the deep fake stuff, I don't know if the audience has seen, for instance, the first one that I saw was Tom Cruise. There was an actor playing, he looks a little bit like Tom Cruise, but then once they've run the algorithm over it, you cannot differentiate this uh, image from Tom Cruise and it's talking and it's pulling faces and it could say anything and you could believe it's him. So um, we've already seen Trump and um, Biden videos as well, very similar. Do we worry? Do, what, I mean, I know. Do I worry? You, you, yeah, well, I know that this is not your um, specialty with uh, um, machine learning because mm. you're just using the, the, you're on the bright side, you're using it as a tool. But how do you feel about it generally? Are you excited about the future with it and do you worry about it? I'm, I'm more excited than nervous about it, but I'm an optimist. Um, and look, I think it comes back to when, when we talk about research, but let's say um, anything else outside of research as well, um, we discuss research integrity quite a bit. And at the end of the day, it is 
um, as Shane was saying, it's, it's about who we are as human and how we use this tool and how did we use Wikipedia, did we abuse Wikipedia, are we still abusing Wikipedia when it comes to our students and the way that they are writing their um, essays. Um, and I think it's just a general application of a, um, not even that new technology, but let's say more in the face of um, the, the public life now. It's a new technology that we have access to and how we use this technology shows our humanity and who we are. Yeah. Um, I'd also say that I think that there's probably going to be a bit more emphasis as well on uh, pe people developing the critical skills they need to be able to assess information. There is no shortage of information anymore. And I think, you know, especially for, for students now who are coming up through high school, through college, you now need to have such powerful skills of discernment and judgment about the data sources that you're using. If you're using Wikipedia to source an essay, that's a problem. If you're using ChatGPT to source an essay, that's a problem because you have no idea what's behind that. You need to be able to go back to the primary sources and do the work yourself. That's the process of doing science, and that's the process of, of sort of reasoning. I asked ChatGPT, I've only ever published one paper in my whole life, and it was in a journal, and I thought, I'll just ask ChatGPT the question that my little paper answered, and it gave the correct answer, perfect. Um, and it attributed it to the correct journal, but a non-existent author, and I thought, it's just been written out of history by a blooming yeah, large so, language model. <laughs> and that's the thing, it would have looked superficially like yes. a, a good citation, right? And, and this is the thing that you know, Shane said earlier, that it, it'll generate something that looks statistically reasonable. And so it doesn't necessarily have an internal logic. And so I'm worried about myself the ability to just generate lots and lots of stuff that looks superficially okay. And I think there's lots of positives about the tools, but there's also, that's my main worry. It isn't machines taking over the world, it's just being bombarded with yet more nonsense, which, you know, we already have a world where we're bombarded with lots of information, which I would say is often, you know, relatively low quality, and will get more, the ability to generate that has just gone up. So critical thinking skills, which are, 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 you know, we try to teach that in primary school, and um, obviously that's one of the key things that we need people to have those critical thinking skills. Yeah. Know what, where is this information coming from? Is it really a reliable? And just and being sceptical as well a little bit about mm -hmm. where, where, you, where you're getting your information. I was reading a fabulous article the other day on the New York Times about um, travel books on Amazon are being created by artificial intelligence and self-published and published by artificially generated people, right? So the photographs of the author itself is even artificially generated. And people, <coughs> all of these travel books have five-star reviews, which have been created by artificial <laughs> intelligence, right? <laughs> Great book, loved it. I really enjoyed the bit about, like, it doesn't make any sense. It has nothing to do with the book, right? And so, so you know, there was even an example of, of someone who had bought this book, which is like half the price of the leading book on Europe, which is by Rick Steve. I, mean, I don't know if anybody buys travel books anymore, but he, he's a very well-known travel author. This guy's name was Mike Steve. <laughs> he came from the same town that Rick Steve came to come mm. from, right? So it's exactly, you know, it's, and I, and I think anybody reading these reviews carefully on Amazon has to be sort of like, this is a scam. So I think we basically just have to be a lot more aware of the fact that there's a lot of rubbish out there, and therefore we should trust valuable sources of information much more. And that's, look, that's the wonderful news about kids is it's very easy to, you only have to show them that a few times that, hey, you can't really trust this. And, and um, kids as young as five years old very quickly learn, um, you know, who you can trust and who you can't trust. That's, that's what kids are great at. So uh, it's another responsibility for teachers perhaps to, that they might not wish to be lugged upon them. But do you think maybe we're heading down the road where 20 years from now, or maybe 200 years from now, we'll be thinking about our concerns about the, the negative side of um, AI, the way the Luddites were worried about the looms being invented all, all those years ago. And it turns out that actually, if you invent a new technology, you put some people out of work for a little while, um, and if we can just find something else for them to do, hopefully they won't be too 
scarred by the experience. But on the whole, it's just wonderful for humanity. We, we, we take boring jobs and replace them with computers and we can think about something more interesting. Is that kind of where we're heading with AI? I, I think there's a lot of work being done on the space of responsible, what they call responsible AI, making sure that algorithms aren't disproportionately um, unintentionally harming certain people. So governments are into this and they want to put in regulations. And so I think in 20 years, th these will be more in place because AI is a new technology and th that these regulations aren't in place yet. But I'm you know, thinking in 20 years time, uh, life is a lot easier and a lot um, better for us because of AI, for sure. Um, there's a, a question about what the, if I'm in high school and I'm sort of thinking, wow, the world is very exciting, what, what do kids need to be good at to, um, if they want to become one of the people sitting on this stage here, they want to use AI in their research, they've, is there any advice we can give young kids at the moment? What should they, should they be learning to do a bit of coding? Is it hard to get into that? Is there um, resources available on the internet they can go for? I know that we were talking earlier about, you know, they could watch Numberphile is a great channel on YouTube. There's all this wonderful info on YouTube. Do, do you guys have advice for young people around this topic? I'll, I'll go first just because I want to talk to those who may not like to code or may be scared of doing math and I want us not to forget about them because we, we do talk about that's the future and everybody let's learn how to code. So let's say that there may be others who may not feel that way and I don't want them to feel left out. Um, let's, let's say that if that is your passion and try and always follow your passion because without it you're not gonna get anywhere. If it is your passion to learn how to code, absolutely. And I'm sure the panel will give you a lot of information about how to achieve that. But if it is something that you definitely don't want to do, don't be scared. There is still a lot of jobs in the future for all of us. I'm hoping that what AI can do for all of us is that instead of working nine to five, we all get to work nine to 12 and go down to the beach and have a much nicer <laughs> life. <laughs> and in some ways, um, I guess you don't have to know how a car works to be able to drive a car to the beach. So you can use the tool, you don't have to understand exactly what's under the bonnet. But hopefully you will be able to know that certain cars should not be purchased. <laughs> right. Um, Danu, what are your thoughts for young people who are uh, in school, um, they still, you know, maybe they haven't decided what they do in year 11 and 12, so should they be, what, what thoughts can you give them? Yeah, I mean, I was a, I'm a biologist, ecologist in high school. I was into to maths and physics and actually didn't do biology until university. And then I did more and more biology and, and alongside maths. Um, so I, I, going on my own, I, I would say maths was extremely helpful for where I am as a biologist. But most biologists don't do as much maths as I would. So it depends on what sort of biologist you want to be. Want to be. Um, I think there's a real opportunity for biologists who are literate in code and maths, and you don't necessarily need to be an expert developing new methods, but being able to work with, there's so much exciting happening in data science and working with, uh, potentially with mathematicians and data scientists, you need to be able to speak a bit of the same language. And so learning how to code or learning how to communicate and understand conceptually what these things do is can give you some some ability to collaborate that you know opens your world in a way that it wasn't before and and that can be really exciting so i would encourage people even if you're a keen biologist think about learning maths and coding as a tool to help you work with the things that you love you know animals plants the natural world there's a wonderful uh, application that i love sharing with school kids i do a little presentation on this sometimes um, the invention of, uh, in 3D animations, in movies, um, they're called boids, B-O-I-D-S. Um, so these are when you don't want to have to draw a flock of birds or a flock of sheep or a, um, you know, a bunch of cows running around. You just write a little bit of code for how they move, how close they get to each other when they're in a, in a flock. And the code for that's really simple. So it came out of the Journal of Theoretical Biology um, years ago that it, this simple little bit of code turns out to mimic nature really closely. And there was this wonderful discovery that you only need three bits of code to make a very accurate looking flock. And, cool. um, 
Are you familiar with this work, by the way? Not that particular one, but I mean, let, let me just, I, I gave the, the answer there, which said a little bit of code and maths might be helpful, but we have endless exciting problems for people who are deeply interested in maths and code, and that's an example of what you might describe as an emergent phenomena. So yes. that's the sort of thing that I'm interested in, is discovering rules about the way systems work. And then, uh, you know, you might want to simulate the way the systems work and put those rules together and see what it takes to recover things that you see in nature. And there, maths and code is really exciting and important. Yeah, it's amazing. By the way, it's, um, the, the first time that appeared in a movie was um, in Batman, the one with Danny DeVito. Uh, and it's the bats at the beginning, in the opening credits, that they were drawn by a computer, just mimicking right. them. And, and then the second one was in Lion King, when there was a stampede of bison or, or some animal. And, it's just this marriage between mathematics and biology that I never saw coming. I, I was just, that's why I like telling kids about it. I didn't see that as a potential thing. Um, do you have any advice for young people who are at the beginning of their um, academic journey, really? If you're in grade 10, you've got all these decisions to make. The kids who love maths, I always say the world's your oyster. What, what would you say to a kid who, who loves maths and where it might it take them? I'd say... Yeah, go with it. It's going to be, if you love it and you can do it really well, then you're really lucky. But to, I'd like, also like to say to those who are a bit hesitant or a bit unsure, um, don't give up on maths because you might actually love it one day. You're a shining example of this. And what I love about your um, career is that it's mathematics. No one would imagine that it takes you into all these different fields that you are now thinking about that um, most people only get to think about their little silo and you're thinking way outside of the maths department here it can be yeah quite a varies so it's not just you know um, so so the world of maths is much much bigger than what you seek in year 10 right so um, yeah don't give up on it don't give up on maths and um, we, we should really um, we, we've got to wrap up very soon so I want to wrap up with the, the very last question which I'll put to you which is the question for tonight was can AI save humanity and uh, it sounds very grandiose, but what do you think, Shane? <laughs> <laughs> well, we could use all the help we can get. I mean, look, we, we are facing some big challenges, right? Climate change, uh, equity, war, um, you know, food, health. All of these are really big generational and longer challenges. And, and you know, when I talk to, to young students, high school students, university students, they are pumped to get out there and start innovating and thinking about really creative ways of solving some of these problems. So, you know, can AI save humanity? Nah, humans can save humanity <laughs> with the help of AI, and in particular, young humans, right? So the, uh, the people I'm most excited about are, are sort of the, the, the people at home, young kids, you know, fooling around with ChatGPT going, I wonder, I wonder if I plug this into that thing you know, what would happen, and creating the next amazing thing that changes all of our lives. That's what I'm most excited about, and that's what's going to save us. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I think on that note, um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I hope that's been as enlightening for you as it has for me. I could listen to these people um, talk all night, but um, <laughs> would you please help me in thanking Dr. Daniel uh, Folster, Dr. Shafa Waters. Um, Sorry. That's fine. I've, I've got to look to make sure I'm saying the right is it associate professors and there's professors and you never want to get that wrong. So <laughs> Professor Yannan Fan and Associate Professor Shane Keating, thank you to all. <laughs> Big round of applause for everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Good night. Thanks, Ruben. Thank you, Ruben.